And we continue going through the material of OpenStax College Physics, Chapter 32, now talking about nuclear fusion, talking about fusion. In this situation, we have nuclei that are small, that are light, near the beginning of the periodic table. They're merging and forming a nucleus that is closer to iron in the periodic table, uh, towards the middle of the periodic table, somewhat before the middle. but. Uh, these lighter nuclei merge and form a nucleus. Energy will be released if the uh, resulting combined nucleus has less mass than the nuclei that came together. Mass is going to become energy. Uh, energy will be released if the nuclei that merge together have more mass than the resulting nucleus. Um, fission, well, we'll take a look in another video, not today. Fission is the case where you have a large nucleus, such as uranium. It splits, and the daughter nuclei and the other products, if you add up all the mass, there's less mass there than the original uranium nucleus. Both of these equals mc squared. The energy released is equal to the mass difference multiplied by the speed of light squared. And we'll, of course, do this in our shortcut way of the conversion factor, 931.5 MeVs per atomic mass unit when we get to that calculation. Our sun is shining, sending us uh, light. There's good evidence that the sun has been shining for an extremely long period of times, and consequently we must have some source of energy of the sun that is able to produce energy for a long time. Uh, the sun is not burning coal, the sun is not burning oil, natural gas, it's not doing chemical reactions of any sort. There's not enough energy available in chemical reactions to account for the huge energy output of the sun. The sun is not shrinking and warming up to any significant degree. The sun is not being continually bombarded by meteorites and warming up through the friction. Instead, the sun is producing energy by nuclear fusion. That was uh, developed, that was concepts in the 1930s. The sun is uh, producing energy by nuclear fusion. And we'll get to the sun a little bit later. So here's our binding energy per nucleon graph. And iron uh, is at the peak of this graph. It's the most stable of the nucleus. It, and that, another way of saying that, it takes the most energy to separate the protons and neutrons when they're in iron compared to other nuclei. When we have fusion, we have some material from the lower part of the periodic table, the smaller nuclei, fusing, producing something that's higher up in the uh, periodic table, uh, such as hydrogen forming helium, helium forming carbon, other reactions forming oxygen or nitrogen or silicon or aluminum, so forth. Or we have fission from some massive nucleus splitting apart the decay products, the daughter products, I shouldn't say decay, the daughter products of the fission are towards the peak of this curve and energy is released. So those are our two choices for nuclear power, um, fusion, merging nuclei and create a, uh, a larger single nucleus that has less mass than the beginning uh, mass, or fission where the uranium splits or some other plutonium something of uh, the fuel there that splits and we have uh, less mass after the fission than before. In both cases we're moving the product towards the peak of the binding energy per nucleon curve. Um, so that's uh, something to, to keep in mind. So if we talk about fusion there's a problem. How do we cause two hydrogens let's say to merge? This Let's take one hydrogen as fixed here and a certain distance away from it uh, as we get past the range of the strong nuclear force. We're going to have repelling action, the Coulomb force out here. So if another proton is coming in and trying to merge with this proton uh, with the strong nuclear force taking over, the strong nuclear force is only active on a, on a very short distance on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. 10 to the minus 15 meters after that nuclear force goes to zero. The Coulomb force is long range. It's repelling for long ranges. So if a proton tries to approach another proton for low energy, uh, incoming proton, low kinetic energy, it, that proton will get repelled. If we have high energy, then the proton can get close enough 
to uh, combine, to merge. Um, so that's our key concept with fusion. We're merging nuclei that are positively charged. We must have a lot of incoming energy. What's the state of the material? If we're going to have high energy in the material, fast speed, tell me something about the temperature of this material. You should say very high temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the material and we need in the millions of Kelvin um, and beyond to have enough speed of the particles, enough kinetic energy, that when they convert that into potential energy and get closer and closer to the other nucleus, they'll get close enough that the strong nuclear force takes over and causes the fusion. So we have to overcome the repelling, electrical repelling force of plus nucleus with plus nucleus. We can do that if there's enough kinetic energy to create a high potential energy. That means particles close together. So here's an artist's illustration of this. Moderate kinetic energies, two object, two nuclei are approaching. They get a certain distance apart, but it's too far apart for the strong nuclear force to take over and they just repel. Another situation with higher temperature, more kinetic energy in the objects, they come in and close and get close and closer and closer, enough close, enough a small distance between them, and the strong nuclear force takes over. We fuse and we'll get some uh, radiations coming off of this in one form or another. But that's the basic of fusion. You need lots of kinetic energy to overcome the electrical repulsion. The strong nuclear force will take over when the nuclei are close enough. We have fusion. So an illustration, there, there are other uh, charts that can be made with fusion, the fusion process of converting hydrogen to helium. For Professor Clement's class, you do not need to memorize this, but you should be aware of some of the characteristics that happen here. So here are two protons that are fusing. When they do so, we uh, have generated a neutrino, it generates a neutrino. In addition to the fusion, uh, creates proton and neutron. Well, how did that happen? How do you think that happened? We had two protons to begin with, then here we have proton and neutron. And we have a positive particle coming off here to carry away the charge of one of the protons. Um, so we're not going to go into that detail, but you should know that there are neutrinos released in the fusion process. There are also gamma rays released. And along the steps here, there's energy released there's less mass in the total, uh, in the single fused element and in the byproducts. There's less mass, we're calling the neutrino a byproduct, and positron a byproduct. There's less mass in the uh, result than there was at the beginning. And consequently, we release energy along here at each step. Um, what you should know for Professor Clement's class is roughly we have four hydrogens here. They end up becoming one helium nucleus. So four hydrogens become one helium, and there's a release of energy. There's a release of uh, gamma rays. There's a release of neutrinos, but fusion. Another way of looking at this in uh, reactions that hope to be taking place in laboratories on the Earth, remember we need temperatures in the hundreds of millions of degrees. We do not have uh, uh, materials that will not melt at hundreds of millions of degrees. Is there any way we could lower the temperature a little bit? That'll make the process easier. Well, we can make the temperature lower if we consider fusion of deuterium, the H2, and tritium, H3. These neutrons carry momentum, but there's no repelling action from the neutrons. So we can end up getting the objects closer together with uh, not as much uh, temperature in the system. Uh, it's an easier reaction to take place, the deuterium and tritium. So this perhaps would be our fuel of the future, and we can get this from our oceans, uh, basically, especially the deuterium uh, is in ocean water. In, it's not greatly abundant, but there's plenty in our ocean water. So we have these objects merge, and uh, a neutron comes off carrying 14 MeVs of kinetic energy. Uh, helium nucleus is generated with 3.5 MeVs of kinetic energy. 
a little review here. Why is it that the neutron has more kinetic energy than the helium nucleus? Because it's smaller, less mass, we're conserving momentum here. So uh, the object that is uh, less massive has more velocity and one half mv squared. Uh, the v squared uh, means that we're going to have more kinetic energy in the smaller mass object. And again, we use deuterium and tritium because these neutrons give the object inertia coming in here, but they don't add to the repelling force. So it's easier to create fission, or sorry, fusion when, uh, when these are used. Um, so they don't have to touch exactly, and there's a little mystery here with the star here, but they have to get really close so the strong nuclear force takes over and we uh, form the, the helium nucleus. So how could we possibly accomplish this on the Earth? One mechanism is the tokamak, and what we have in here are very strong magnetic fields. We know that magnetic fields will create force on a charged particle. At these high temperatures, and millions of kelvins, uh, the material is a plasma. It's ionized material. This is not blood plasma, but it's uh, atoms that have been ionized. So we have plasma, charged particles, and the magnetic field in here can act like a bottle and keep the uh, hot material away from the walls. That's important. Uh, so it doesn't melt the walls and the walls don't cool down the material. We need a high temperature to get fusion reactions to take place. So there are huge magnetic fields that create force on the, uh, on the charged particles, the deuterium, the tritium, and keep them confined. To get fusion, we need two things. We need high temperature and we need relatively high density so we have a good probability of these objects colliding. And the tokamak has that. There's ways of injecting energy in here. We won't get into the details. But we have this hot material uh, dense enough when it's constrained by the magnetic field to uh, have fusion go on. And these are in the laboratory now being tested. And they are reaching the place where the energy being produced is uh, roughly equal to the cost of the uh, uh, energy required to make the magnetic field, to make the plasma hot, and so forth. Break even, where the value of the energy produced is a match for the cost of creating the uh, fusion conditions. Uh, so that's one mechanism that's going to be explored, and there's uh, a large uh, unit of this being built in Europe in a couple of you know, four years from 2014 now. Um, it, perhaps 2018 it'll be operational and uh, we'll see if this principle works on a bigger scale. Another drawing of the tokamak or the pink area here would be where the plasma is being confined. Um, and now another method of fusion. We need to get high density, we need to get high temperatures. Um, another way of accomplishing this is to take hydrogen pellet, take hydrogen contained inside a pellet. Uh, so imagine a marble. At the core of the marble, it's been hollowed out. And as deuterium and uh, uh, tritium in there, fuel for fusion, on the outside, there's material that absorbs light, absorbs this laser light. So the lasers here, high-powered lasers, they shine on this pellet from all directions and it causes a compression of the pellet. Again, light carries momentum, so it causes compression of the pellet and can bring the conditions up to a high enough temperature and high enough density that fusion can be uh, produced. So this is a, uh, another mechanism that's under test. Does this look like it might cost a lot of money? The answer is yes. Here's a person standing here. This And the tokamak also uh, machinery is much, much bigger than a person. Uh, so a lot of expense going going on, multinational research. Uh, this is something that would be a great advantage if we could get commercial production of energy by fusion rather than the fission of uranium. Uranium is rare. Uranium has a problem with waste, radioactive waste products that have long half-lives. There's much more fuel for fusion in our oceans and it won't drain the oceans dry. We don't need much uh, because there's so much energy released. And also the fusion reactions have less radioactive waste. So it would be a much better situation um, if, if this could uh, be, uh, be developed. So this started to be researched in the 60s, the 1960s. 
and saying perhaps by the turn of the century, the year 2000, we'd have fusion. There are no fusion commercial reactors. Maybe by 2030, there'll be uh, fusion nuclear reactors that are commercially uh, in operation. Uh, many would say that's still optimistic. It's very difficult to keep this material at high density and high temperature and uh, get it to run continuously or at least a near continuous cycle to produce the energy that's required. But certainly a worthy area of research, um, fusion energy. Um, in the sun, though we have uh, this continuous fusion in the sun, we know that there's fusion going on in the sun because we can measure neutrinos that come out of the fusion reactions. The neutrino does not interact very much with matter. Um, you know, if we have lead between the sun and the nearest star, I think roughly half of the neutrinos would get through that shielding. Uh, neutrinos don't react very much, but they do react a little bit, and uh, we can have neutrinos detector built on the Earth that measure these. In the 1960s, the first measurements were done, and they revealed that there were not enough neutrinos coming out of the sun to match the required amount of energy the sun is radiating off in light. It seemed that the uh, sun was partially off, or our calculations were off, and what it wrong was that we did not understand the neutrino well enough. The neutrino comes in different varieties, and it seems to be true that on its route from the sun to the earth, it changes form, and it changes into a form that the, at least some of them do, that the neutrino detectors of the 1960 could not detect. Now our neutrino telescopes are better calibrated, and we, uh, physicists are measuring the amount of neutrinos that match um, the required number of fusions to produce the energy that the sun is emitting. And calculations say that the sun has enough fuel for another five billion years. Um, the visible light energy that comes out of the sun, the kinetic energy working its way to the surface, takes hundreds of thousands of years from the core to the surface. These neutrinos just take uh, eight and a half minutes to move from the sun to the earth. Um, so much more there, you need to take an astronomy course uh, to understand that. But here's an example of neutrino detector. The neutrino, it can interact with uh, certain atoms and make them uh, energetic and um, become detectable as those energetic atoms um, emit radiations that can be detected by the photomultiplier emit light, a special kind of light. We won't get into that detail, um, but uh, we have huge tanks of water underground to shield from ordinary radiation. The neutrinos can go through layers of the earth easily and uh, activate the, uh, the sensors in here and make measurements of a few a day uh, is all that uh, is detected, but that matches what's uh, required given that the neutrinos don't interact very much with, with matter. Um, the supernova in 1987, just outside the Milky Way galaxy, and in the nuclear reactions here, there were as a tremendous release of uh, neutrinos that actually helps blow the star apart. Um, but those neutrinos were detected on the Earth, and uh, it was a great uh, study that was done by astronomers and combined with the uh, physicists who study neutrinos to uh, give us more information, more knowledge about how stars explode and create elements, create the heavy elements in this explosion. Um, so fusion uh, takes high temperature, takes high density. It's a difficult uh, process because it requires us a very high temperature to get the, the nuclei close enough together so the strong nuclear force takes over. Uh, the tokamak, magnetic confinement, make a magnetic bottle is one line of research, and inertial confinement, where lasers shine on a pellet that causes the pellet to compress and get to state of high temperature and high density where fusion does take place. Keep reading about fusion.